and thanks for tuning in to the EndpointSecurity.ca podcast from Positive E-Solutions. I'm Robbie Ferguson, and through the course of this podcast, combined with our blog, we want to provide you with a free resource to be able to educate yourself and your staff about the cybersecurity issues that are affecting your company in 2019. Now, last year, 2018, certainly had its share of high-profile data breaches. Sadly, they've become a part of our everyday life. According to the Breach Level Index, an organization that collects breach statistics, nearly 13.5 billion data records have been lost or stolen since 2013. Now, that's more than 6 million each day. And are you ready for this? 4,278 data records lost or stolen every single minute. But this is something no organization or individual should have to simply accept as normal. Um, Think about how panicked you would feel if you discovered that your wallet or your purse was missing. Everything that defines you as a person is in there, and canceling and replacing all of those items would be a nightmare. When there's an E. coli scare in a product, say, uh, for example, romaine lettuce, everybody immediately removes all of the romaine lettuce from the store shelves instantly. Um, The reaction is swift, decisive, and widespread. By contrast, there seems to be a bubble of complacency that has settled over the whole data breach concept. Breaches aren't treated with the same seriousness, and they really deserve to be. Uh, It's either the consumer or the corporate decision makers, it doesn't matter who. To understand the whys and hows of this, I'm joined by Lissa Myers, a senior security researcher at ESET. Lissa, thanks for joining me. Thanks, good to be here. Lissa, breaches seem to be pretty much commonplace now. Um, has your research pointed to any common cause? Well, uh, there are a lot of different causes, but depending on whose data you're looking at, generally between 60 and 80 percent of uh, data breaches are the pinpoint cause is login credential loss. So either the account was hacked or phished or something along those lines where someone has stolen username and password. Login credentials generally are kind of uh, just a simple place of getting in depending on how the network is connected. Like thinking back to the target breach is a really good example. You Mm -hmm. have an HVAC vendor, so they're, you know, heating and cooling and they access the target databases just to do their heating and cooling thing. Uh And the way that their network was set up, as well as Target's network, they were able to get from point A, which is the HVAC vendor, to point B, which was the point of sale machines at Target. Right. And so, you know, people have this expectation that it's actually hard to get from, you know, one point to another within a network, but the way that a lot of Uh, organizations set their networks up, it really isn't that hard for them to go from point A being a password to point B being the place where everyone stores their credit cards. Right. So we're we're generally speaking about the credentials of the internal corporate network, not like necessarily online websites or anything like that, but the actual login credentials to my computer, to the internal databasing, the servers, those kinds of things. Yeah. I mean, when you think about all the things that your passwords allow you to access. I mean, yes, your email is part of it, and that does have value to sure. uh, criminals. Yeah. But there's also login credentials to networks. There's login credentials to databases and all sorts of different things. Yeah, I even think about the way things like ransomware spreads. And, you know, if you were to be able to log into my computer, well, I have the credentials that allow me personally to access network shares, for example. So now... Yeah. Here's an entry point for ransomware, just as an example. Um, Lissa, are people becoming complacent, uh, or uh, should I say, are they as complacent as they seem? Uh, with politicians in, in uh, so many countries really pushing for, uh, to be tough on crime, um, why are these breaches so short-lived in the news cycle? Well, I think part of that is just that the, the, the world we live in right now is so full of just dramatic news. Yeah. that everything gets pushed quickly, but also there's a, a real lack of understanding of what security entails and what people can actually do. And that's kind of my yeah. main message to people is that peop- uh, security can feel kind of hopeless and overwhelming, but that is really not the truth at all. There's something that each and every single one of us can do to improve our own security and companies in particular, there's a lot more that they should be doing to improve security. 
So is it the mainstream media that is maybe not educated in cybersecurity and so it just kind of drops off or is it the consumer you know driving for okay we want the next thing we want the we want to know more about the next big exploit i think it's a lack of education kind of from one end to another like consumers don't necessarily understand how much risk they're being put at yeah and the media doesn't necessarily understand the extent that it's a problem and legislators don't understand, and, you know, and companies who are protecting our data don't necessarily understand. Mm. Um, from an economical standpoint, um, what about corollary costs? Like, for example, um, let's say insurers who are taking a second look at the mega breaches that have occurred, like Marriott. Um, is this going to trickle down into other areas of the economy? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the whole idea with risk assessment is that they're, you know, accept, avoid, mitigate and transfer. And uh, insurance is meant to transfer that risk. And insurers are kind of realizing, you know, how much they've bitten off here. Yeah. And it's huge. It's absolutely huge. Even when there's a fairly significant uh, cost that's quoted up front, that doesn't necessarily hold true over time. Like right. at, over time, they realize, oh, this is actually going to cost considerably more. And so insurers are either moving towards insuring smaller businesses where the risk is not as much for them particularly, or they're changing the policies to where there is a lot more onus on the organizations to prove that they're securing themselves properly, mm -hmm. which that is the part that I see as being beneficial is that, you know, it's not good to just kick the ball down the road. You need to ensure that people are actually protecting themselves in order to get the insurance. So you can't just transfer the whole risk to somebody else mm. because that costs everybody. And you know, the, again, with the target breach, if you look back at the cost that banks incurred, because I don't know if you remember, but like everybody got a brand new credit card after the Target and Home Depot breaches because like a huge percentage of the population had their payment card details compromised. And that right. was a massive, massive cost that was shouldered by the banks rather than the the organization that got breached. Yeah, and it's funny that I've never even considered the cost that that would have been incurred by that. Um, yeah, and it's not just big banks. I mean, obviously, credit unions and little, small, local banks were also affected. So it's, you know, big organizations, small organizations, that cost gets filtered out to the entire economy, essentially. Sure. So with, uh, you know, the costs involved considered, we're going to, I would imagine we're going to see the entire, you know, what is being exploited, how is this data being used, um, that whole landscape evolving over the next 10, 11 months. Um, it, as you look into 2019, do you foresee more breaches or uh, bigger ones even, or different types <laughs> of breaches? The short answer is yes. The long answer is we're already seeing a lot of uh, payment cards uh, are a fairly short shelf. They have a fairly short shelf life. Things like uh, medical ID or mm. insurance or you know things like that, where uh, like social security in the U.S. and uh, most company countries have their own version of something like that. Yeah, like social those insurance things, numbers here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are all pretty well permanent. Like those are not something that you can easily cut off and start with a new number. And so that's much more valuable to criminals because that has such a long shelf life that basically sticks with you for the rest of your life. Right. And so it's the onus is now on you and me to check our information for basically the rest of our lives because if that information is lost, then we need to continue to check, make sure that, you know, credit card accounts are not being made in our name or you know, drugs ordered for us or in our names, basically. Yeah. So we're kind of we're kind of leaning toward the the consumer end of you know how how does this affect me as a, an individual? Um, so along that vein, Lissa, um, what can the average person do to protect themselves against, in particular, the the repercussions and the ongoing issues that come from a data breach, especially considering that they themselves may not even know that their data has been exploited. Yeah, the I it's the point we're at right now, we have to be a little bit more reactive. There's not a, a, as much as I would hope 
to do proactively. In the US, I, I recommend people get credit freezes as a proactive measure, but that isn't available in all countries, Canada being one of them. And so it, it be, you know, it's important for us to check our credit report and check our medical statements and check our credit card re report statements and make sure that there isn't funky stuff happening there, that what we're seeing is what's expected and responding quickly if we do see something that's strange. I wonder if that has in fact become a more difficult challenge for individuals because we're so connected now and everything is on the smartphone apps and you know, are we as meticulous with our, uh, with our credit card statements, for example, these days? Yeah, I don't really have a sense of that, of, of how people are about it in just general life, but yeah. the, the good part about so much being online is that, you know, on my credit card report, I can now set up an alert so it will email me anytime there is any sort of charge. And I've actually had an experience where there was a fraud that came through and I was able to call before the charge even officially hit my account and say, hey, this is not me. Shut that account down. Yeah. And start over. Oh, I really like that idea. I uh, imagine that's something you set up with your credit card company. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Uh, and there's a lot of different things you can do that with. Like if your uh, doctor has some availability to get uh, a list of charges on your account yeah. online, you can do that just immediately. Well, that's the, that's the positive end of the evolution of how our data is interconnected these days. Um, Lisa, I realize this is a loaded question, uh, but what sort of shelf life are we looking at? You mentioned that this could impact, like if our data was breached, it could impact me for the rest of my life. Um, so how long after a data breach um, occurs could I personally, let's say nothing has happened with the data and I feel like maybe there's, it hasn't been exploited. Is there ever a point in my life where I can feel safe? Uh, as much as I uh, am loath to use the word safe, I would say mm. that the way things are right now, me personally, I continue to look forever. Like, even if there hasn't been a breach recently of anything that I was involved with, I continue to look because there's, like you said, you don't necessarily know. Like, the organization that has been breached may not find out or not completely understand that they've been breached for years. Right. And so it's better just to be very vigilant about checking, make sure that all, all the things look as they should. Okay. Well, thank you on that ominous note. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lisa, let's, let's circle back to, so away from the consumer here, let's, let's get back into business and look at the IT security specialists. Like what kind of advice would you give to the IT department uh, about protecting their companies, not only from a data breach that they may themselves um, have, conducted against their company, but also being unwittingly complicit in, uh, in someone else's data breach? There are actually a lot of things that, I, uh, that you can do. Uh, one uh, is, uh, as we mentioned, the password, uh, password credentials. Make sure that you have multi-factor authentication. And uh, most of us have had some experience with that at this point, where you get sent a one-time code to your email or to a dongle creates it or it's an app that creates a, a one-time code, that gives another layer of protection against uh, login credential theft. And is the, part of the, the difficulty with that in the early stages was a lot of people felt like that was just too much effort. But A, we see that there's a huge return on investment in terms of decreasing the risk. But B, the way that those two-factor authentication things are set up now, it is much less of a hurdle for people. So it's a much more seamless. Another thing that I would suggest is make sure that you're doing risk assessment on an ongoing basis. This isn't something you should do like once every year or once every, God forbid, five years. <laughs> do it ongoing, like Every time there's a new machine in your network, every time there's a, you know, a new database or something, you need to make sure that those are accounted for in your risk assessment. And the third thing that I would suggest is network segmentation. So the target breach, we have external vendor and giant retailer. 
there should have been a number of places where they could have segmented the network such that that sort of transfer was not possible. They should have had the sensitive area of the network being the point of sales machines completely separate from the outside world, even you know, if they're trusted external vendors. Well, that's a lot of great information. Lisa, thank you so much. Uh, it seems to be an endless fight, and it's great to have experts such as yourself keeping watch. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Here at endpointsecurity.ca, we're obviously very concerned for the safety and security of our customers, their businesses, and their data. But as our chat here shows, the concern can't end there. It's the data and activities of other people too, those who somehow, some way, get connected to our customers through legitimate means as well as through um, the breaches and the hacks that you hear about here. We have a blog that follows on from this conversation. You can find it at endpointsecurity.ca. And as always, our close relationship with the experts at ESET means we've got your back. So thanks again to our guest, Alyssa Myers, for joining me today. And thank you for listening. Be sure to check out uh, the next chapter in our ongoing series on cybersecurity for Canadian business at endpointsecurity.ca. Take care. I'm Robbie Ferguson. Stay safe.